The following is intended only for mature audience. Viewer and listener discretion is advised. Hey folks, P. Bissardo here, and you're listening to the Smoke Free Radio Network. Not only is he my male bondsman, uh, he, he thinks... Everybody say hello to Mr. The actual only third way in our country right now. Right I'm gonna try. I'm going to try to actually talk a little bit uh, and maybe not get into uh, some videos. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like the ones that's a lot of the ones that really. Funny. I mean, in their mind, it's revo- they're revolutionary, you know, force, right? And I mean, obviously, to get rid of the stand. It's, it's crazy to me. And I feel like Big Tobacco sitting there laughing. They're like, <laughs> this is great. Right? I don't. I don't claim to know a lot of stuff when it comes to advocacy. Uh, I don't. Really... Are calling this a, a, an epidemic? Um, we're in the middle of the third wave. wave of... yeah, such as BSFA, such as Big Ramsey. Oh wow! <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> With any issue, right? Everybody has their uh, their preconceived uh, bias, and uh, anything you throw at them uh, might move them a little bit, but they're they're going to be anchored. Welcome back to another edition of Vaping in the Mic. Nice orange tennis racket background, courtesy of one Dimitri Agrafiotis. I had to make my, my tennis racket pop filter feel a little bit more at home. At least I'm not sitting here like this this evening, although it would probably sound a lot better. We'll, we'll at least put it down just a little bit so everybody can say, hey, there, there's a mouth behind all of that. Yes, I am not an automaton. This evening, this evening, coming out of Canada, is a guy that I've wanted to have on the show for a while because I keep reading things that he's posting, things that he's doing, and this man is all over the place. And his background, where he came from to where he is now, is one of those things that just intrigues the hell out of me. So if you would, this evening... And I never did ask how to pronounce his last name, but it is coming up here, Mr. Thomas Kursop. Is that correct? Yep, you hit it. My God, I actually got one right for a change. How are you doing this evening? Good, good, good. And yourself, how was your old age? Oh, yeah. I, I'm here. I'm good. I'm vertical. <laughs> I can't complain. Any day on the right side of the grass is a good day. That's right. They, they, that was a saying, any day above ground is a good day. And I'm like, yeah, it is. You have, and you even mentioned it when we were talking before, what industry were you in previously to being a shop owner? Uh, For a little over 20 years, I was a power engineer. So basically, I ran industrial boilers uh, in a handful of different industries. So there was manufacturing, power generation, and then the last dozen or so years, I was in the heavy oil industry in northern Alberta. Were you involved in any, and the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head is the tar sands area over yes. there. Yes. Yeah, that's where I was in northern Alberta. Ah. Was I spent it, a lot of time up there. Was it as rough as what they were talking about? I, I mean, mm. as far as difficulty-wise. It depends who you're talking to. I was a plant operator, so it's not like I was a drill rig operator. Uh I ran around a $13 billion plant and I either ran the control room, in which case the heaviest thing I lifted was a mouse (laughs) or uh, I was out in the field watching a tank farmer doing the commissioning. Right. Uh, So there was times when you're doing heavy work, but not all of it. Uh, I weigh 300 pounds. It couldn't have been that heavy work. (laughs) I remember looking at some of your news feed when you retired and you were hanging up your helmet. Yeah. And, and it was kind of an emotional thing because safety is something that I have to say up north of the border is taken much more seriously than it is south of the, the border. Well, I, I don't have any experience south of the border, but yeah, especially up where I was and for the company that I was working with when I left the industry safety was a very big thing it it was like the end all be all we would shut down a million dollar job because there was snow on the ground and it needed to be removed so yeah there was a huge focus on safety at that site wow 
it, it's just it, watching all the people responding to things that they were saying. It, and, and you knew that safety was such an intimate factor in your everyday job. It's like you had a litany of things that you would accomplish just for safety's sake before you even started your day. Yep. And I look at manufacturing facilities down here of various natures. Safety is there if you're around machinery, but it's not on the top of everybody's head all the time. You know? That can differ from company to company because, trust me, there's some shady people up here, too. I've worked for a few where I didn't stay very long. I can understand uh, it just that. so happens that in the oil sands, when I was working up there, almost every company up there has a huge focus on safety because that entire industry is under a microscope to begin with, right? Uh, so there's, there's, there's a pretty big focus. You mentioned, and I'm only going to bring this up, just you mentioned it and it really made me step back and go, wow. Um, you have a hearing loss of nature's and you said in your right ear can you yeah uh, 15 years or so ago i was working on a boiler and we were venting to atmosphere and that's incredibly loud like it for me it i i can get the math around it but most people just can't picture how much power can be in steam uh and what happened was is our safety plugs our ear plugs at this one plant were attached to strings so that you wouldn't lose them when you took them out in the lunchroom. And as I'm working next to this vent that's going out the roof, I turned my head and the string caught on my collar and popped the ear plug out. And uh, that resulted in in some long-term difficulty hearing out of that ear. Uh, When I want to go to sleep and I don't want to hear anybody, I sleep on my left ear. (laughs) It just... it. It's been a while since I've spoken to anybody that has been in any heavy industry. And it reminded me very quick of the first couple of times that I did not put safety first and paid the price for it, you know, in various ways. Yep. It's just, it makes me sit back and go, wow. Uh, folks, you're, if you would like to, the phone lines are actually open this evening. You can call in to 215-383-5752 be able to talk to myself or to Thomas. When you hear the lady's voice come on, press 1 to get into the queue, and that'll show up on another screen that I've got way over here on my left. Now, how long was it before you did a retirement, so to speak, because you're definitely not retired. You're doing something that you love doing. But did you open your shop or shops before you retired and then moved into them? Yeah, we opened the first shop uh, about two and a half years before I pulled the pin up north. Uh, And it was running, my wife would run it while I was up north, and then I would come home and I would run the shop so that she she could get some time. And then I would go back up north for my next rotation. She'd run the shop. And we did that for a few years. Uh, But what happened was, is I was starting to get arthritis in my feet. And Mm. when half of your job involves running up and down ladders... Arthritis in your feet is kind of a rough thing. So I needed to make a plan. So what we did was we opened up the second shop. And now I run this shop. She runs the original shop back in Morinville. And we're making a go of it. Now it's not anywhere near oil sands money. I can tell you that firsthand. But we managed to feed the kids and pay the bills. And really, that's all I want out of it. We're going to talk about a couple of things the differences between here in the united states and up in canada here as we go along but i remember you explaining to somebody your shops are called alternative and options alternatives and options correct yeah that's correct and you named them almost generically for specific reasons true yes uh when I when we were talking about the first shop, I got into vaping. I was 42 or 43, so I was on the older end of the spectrum. And I know there was some shops that I felt pretty comfortable in as a 43-year-old father, walking in, looking around, you know, buying my stuff and leaving. But there was other shops I'd go into, and it just kind of, kind of put me off a bit. So when we started our business, I took a, I made a list of all the things I'd seen in shops that I liked. And all the things I'd seen in shops that 
didn't really fit my demographic because my target audience, I want those 40 year old smokers. I want the 50 year old smokers. I want the senior citizen smokers because a lot of shops don't cater to them. You walk in and the whole atmosphere is geared towards a younger, more urban crowd. And where I am, we're full of old right-wing farmers. So uh, everything from the name of the shop to the way we decorate is geared around appealing to your mother. I want a place that your mother would walk into and not feel uncomfortable. And that was a good chunk behind the name. But sometimes you're a little too clever for your own good. I've had people come in and ask if I hem pants because they think it's alterations. (laughs) No, there's there's no hemming going on. Uh, but I, I loved how you took the time to think very long term when you were just naming the shop. And that was only yeah. the beginning. That's on the outside. Because in Canada, you're not allowed to see into the vape shop, correct? Well, that depends on what jurisdiction you're in. Uh, some provinces have laws around covering your windows, making sure you can't see in. Other provinces like Alberta, where I'm operating now, have no laws in place at all. In fact, we're just going through a review of the Tobacco Act here in this province. Pardon me. With the intention of adding vaping into this act. So you might see laws like here, that here soon. But from my perspective, we always covered the windows. I'm, I'm not here to attract minors. I don't want little kids peering in the windows because it's cool or hip. So it was easier just to do it right off the start, right? When we started our shop, vaping technically wasn't even legal in Canada. Really? Uh, Until the TVPA came into play in 2018. If you asked Health Canada what they thought about vaping, their answer was is nicotine in that format, unless it's medicinal, is not legal. Uh, there was a clause in one piece in one obscure piece of legislation that said, unless the dosage unit is below four milligrams. And that is what the entire Canadian industry latched on to, to justify our existence until May of 2018. And that, that drives me just up the wall because it, a lot of things that are happening or back then did happen in the United States, as far as the CDC and especially the FDA back then, really began to color what was happening in Canada. Even when when we had deeming regulations put into place in 2016, it had impact in what was happening up north. I, I would say by far the biggest impact that I can think of when we talk about U.S. impact on on Canada as a foreign body is actually the recent round of illness. Because even when the FDA was going off two years ago and talking about the deeming, if you talk to Health Canada or Canadian governments, they were kind of leaning more towards a UK model. Uh, They weren't out and out coming out and saying that vaping's better than smoking or anything. But when you looked at how they positioned their statements, they were tended to be leaning more towards the UK model of doing things as far as accepting vaping as harm reduction. Whereas the U.S., from my perspective, tended to be more prohibition-based, right? They have a long history of war on everything, so alcohol, drugs, and vaping just rolled right into that. Uh, But once we started seeing this vaping-related illness, that really did have impact in Canada because the CDC took off And uh, the reality is both countries, the black market is pretty much doesn't recognize the border. The black market problems you see in the U.S., they're very likely up here in Canada. But that whole take on vaping becoming more dangerous than smoking, that hit us hard up here. I know in September, I dropped 20%. Wow. Wow. And this is, they didn't even have anything that was going on. Since the CDC has come out and they have basically finally grudgingly acknowledged that it is not a nicotine-based system, that it is vitamin E, vitamin E acetate, which is belonging to either hemp cannabis or something different, has any of the 20% drop been able to 
make its way back into your store, or is it still down that yeah, much? Yeah, we've we've come back somewhat, uh, and it wasn't because our press was doing any great favors for us. In fact, if you were to look at the major Canadian press, they're still very much on the whole E Valley thing. Uh, we have a reporter, Carly Weeks, out of the Globe and Mail. Nineteen out of her last twenty articles were about vaping. Wow. None of them were very popular within the vaping circles. No. Uh, but what we what happened was is when a valley, and I actually don't like that term because it was invented to get people to think relating the illness with vaping. Yes. Right. But this this vaping related illness, uh, when it started up, I, I was digging deep and it didn't take long before we figured out it was the black market cannabis and, and the vitamin E acetate. The cannabis industry was actually talking pretty loud about it back in August. Right. And that's how most of us found out about it was we went to Leafly and started reading their articles about this, this product that was being used to step on THC oil. So what happened was, is I put out a notice uh, letter to the editor in my local paper we had handouts printed for the shop so that anybody who came in and had questions, we could just hand that to them. That allowed us to come back fairly strong from that loss, but I still haven't got back to my August numbers yet. And I don't anticipate that happening until probably March or April, because February is usually a pretty weak month anyway, right? It's mm-hmm. only 28 days long. So it, it's going to be a process, but my trends show the numbers are indeed coming back for the shop. A uh, little bit slower growth. My biggest concern is the lack of smokers. We used to be converting two or three smokers a week. And now if I'm lucky, I see one a month. Uh, wow. And long term, that's something to be concerned with, right? Because that's not even enough to replace attrition over the long term. No. And that's, for lack of better words, the people that smoke are exactly who you need to be having walking in. Because yeah. that's that's new customers. Extended well, if your growth. entire model is built around reaching forty-year-old smokers, eighteen-year-old vapors don't help you much. Uh, no, you know you, we're not. They come, but we're not geared for them. We don't run that type of operation. No, uh, so so it's a concern, and I'm watching it, and I'm constantly trying to think about new ways to to get that message up because in Canada, we also have some promotion restrictions that you guys don't have yet in most States. Uh, Here it's federally illegal for me to compare vaping and its emissions to smoking and its emissions. I cannot tell a customer that vaping is better for them. The FDA Uh, hemmed us in, in the same way in their deeming regulations. They, it's like one of their biblical thou shalt not be able to turn around and tell someone that vaping is safer than smoking. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to say, you know, and and like you you can't compare that. There's no tar, no carcinogens, you know, that you want to light up a cigarette, have a ball. Here's 700 things that are in it. Oh, by the way, in in vaping products, we have just a very few minimal things. Yeah. And you probably could not even think about trying to tell people, verbally of the Royal College of Physicians in England and anything that they came out with. That I can say. What happens is if somebody comes in and asks me, is vaping better than smoking? My immediate answer to them is federally, I cannot legally answer that question. However, (laughs) over on the far wall there, is a rack of studies and whatnot that you can go and look at for your own information. And in particular, there is one on the second row on the left-hand side from the Royal College of Physicians. And you are invited to go have a look at that. And go that's the smartest five. thing. I, I remember seeing uh, some things going back and forth between you and Dimitri, who I, I saw pop into the chat room. I don't know if he's still in there. But the wall of information that you have is astounding. Uh, I don't think so. It's only got about 15 different studies on it. There's 200 of them out there. But you're providing 
15 different studies for anybody to walk over, pull out a pamphlet and take, or in this, some cases, a stack of paper yeah. that you are saying, you know what, take as many as you want, take a look at them, take them home, read them. Yeah, to a point. They don't get to take home the Royal College of Physicians. That's 200 pages. Yeah, that thing's like here. <laughs> But no, the idea was, is I wanted that information for the customer, right? Because they, they might have the same questions I did. And where I had to go out and find all this stuff on my own, part of my job as a retailer or as a, a, a supporter of harm reduction technology is to help them access this information. So the smaller studies, the stuff I can print out on one or two pages, that's generally free issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's open source. Those are printed out. They can take that home. Some of the larger studies, the ones I had to pay for, they're going to have access limitations and, you know, uh, copyright and whatnot. Those are there. I can page through it with the customer. If I happen to know where the page is that they require to get answer their question, I can go through that with them. Uh, you used to see in the older vape shops in the UK, you used to see this stuff pop up where they would have this wall with the pamphlets and the studies and, the, uh, and I wanted to bring that back. I, I think that's an important part. One is it helps the consumer ease their concerns, right? And not necessarily because they're reading it, but just because they walk in the door and they see that wall, they automatically associate that with me. So it eases their concerns about the business, you know, we're serious. We're not joking around. No, we're not here for giggles or a fast buck in a new car. We're here to help smokers quit. And that wall helps get that message across. It it does definitely separate you from other shops that, like you say, you know, they, they might be in it for purely business model reasons. You know, whatever their, their end result of a business model might be. But... You put it in there, and and people are paying attention. They're they're looking, and and when Dimitri had said, you know, that he was going to take a picture and and show people and add it to what he is out teaching. If I if memory serves me correctly, and if not, somebody, you know, address it for me. But even he was saying that he wants to be able to put that into his repertoire when he's talking with people to show yeah. them. Here's somebody all the, the way up in Canada, not not in the United States, in Canada, that is doing the right thing. I am certain that there are shops in the U.S. that are also doing similar things. Yes, I would uh, agree. It's really easy to become focused on a problem, right? And I get it, because I, I can get caught up in the same thing. But there are people all over the place who are doing the right thing. Uh, and sometimes it's important to point out those folks, right? And it's not always just that one guy in Canada or that one guy in Florida or, you know, the guy in London. But there's a, I think, I, got, I believe in my heart, there's a lot of the older shops that were started by the people who found vaping and found that it worked for them. They're trying very hard to do the right thing. Uh, but like with any business, you're, you're, your business spectrum goes from one end to the other, right? From ethical to crooked, from upstanding to back alley. Yep. Any business is like that. And it, it is, it's the same thing that you mentioned early on. It's the difference when you walk into any vapor store, you're pretty much going to be able to see it from the minute that you walk in the door, whether they fall on one end of the spectrum or the other. Because I don't think that there's a lot of them that try to split right down the middle. Meaning a shop that caters to more vapors and then a shop like yours that is trying to seriously convert smokers. Well, we try to split. If you look, like my shop is literally split. Everything on the south half of the shop is mouth to lung. And that would include like the, 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 these kits, the salt nick devices, anything that's puff related is on that side. Mm -hmm. Anything that is direct to lung is on the north side of the shop. And that goes right down to the juice. I got two towers of juice in the shop and one is 50, 50 standard nick and salt nicks. And the other tower is all the high VG stuff. So 
it can be done. It just takes a little bit of thought. The, the thing is, is what I find with this industry is kind of like with smokers. When you're talking to that guy who quit in 1972 with sheer will, willpower, the only thing he says everybody needs is sheer willpower because that's what worked for him. Right. And if you can't do it, you're a pussy. Yeah. The True. guy who quit with the patch is going to tell everybody, I quit with the patch. The guy who quit with Zyban is going to cheer up Zyban because that's what got him off. The vaping industry is no different. And I see it every day. We only need 12 milligram because that's what got me to quit. Well, <laughs> we only need three milligram in a sub ohm tank because that's what got me to quit. Yeah. If you can't quit with that, it that's that's a problem with you. The reality is all of these things are tools. And as a shop owner, it's my job to talk with the guy who comes through the door and help him or her identify the tool that will work best for them. And that includes everything in the arsenal from the jewel device to the stealth device to salt nick in a, in a pod system or a tank to 12 milligram free base liquid liquid in a tank to three milligram at 80 watts. It's about identifying what that particular customer needs. And that's something I find we lose track of in the industry because we, the whole industry tends to focus on whatever's new mm -hmm. in the last five minutes <laughs> and everything else is in the discount bin. Yes. It's, but if you're truly running the shop, your job is to figure out which one of the many tools at your disposal will help this particular individual get to where they want to go. And the next individual is a whole new process all over again. There is no one silver bullet answer. See, I like how you think, and even somebody else in there, Janie said, love that idea. And it's true. You know, I, I know that variations of what you're saying are true. Uh, Dimitri and Phil, are they've got their entire line of hardware that they're doing and traveling throughout the US, or throughout the, the world really he made a comment and he said one point in time that mount the lung sells like horribly in the states and they have sold more of their equipment in france alone than all of the u.s and i was like but wow you well know, you also have cultural differences right uh, because we see it somewhat in Canada. The, I like to call it the Tim Allen effect, right? More power, R, 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 R. <laughs> uh, where more power is seen as better. But the thing is, is, is when you start to really think about it, it's not always better. Sometimes it's better, but that depends on the individual. So, and, and, particularly in North America, the entirety of North America tends to be very focused on trend, right? What's new this week? What's on fleek, I think, is what the young people say. Uh, yeah. and, and because it's a young industry run by largely younger people, it reflects that attitude. Uh, I think in the UK, and I had, it's not like I've driven around the UK any. I know some UK folks online but i've never been there but as a rule you tend to find it's a little bit older crowd involved at least from what i can see so but i could be wrong on that too no i think that you're right up there and taking a good look at what's going on it, the, the major difference that i keep falling back and looking at between the united states here and above the border in canada where you're at the health industry here is a for-profit health industry. That's correct. And up there, it is not. Up there, health no. is health. We, we take care of our citizens, and yes, we have a wider range of taxes and different ways that it is paid for, but if you're sick, you go to the hospital, you get your treatment, and you survive and go home. That's been my experience. Now... You're going to find people that are for or against it up here. Just like if you go down south, you'll find people that are for or against the private system, right? I try not to get involved in that too much. But uh -huh. the big difference is the fact that up here, if you can stop four or 
4 million Canadians from smoking. That does eventually equate to a direct cost savings for the federal government. Now, we have to balance that with the multi-billions that they take through tobacco taxes, because that also comes into play. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, for the the health benefit, it shouldn't be that hard. Or it's not supposed to be that hard. Not supposed to be. For us to convince the government that, hey, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, this vaping thing. Uh, There's days when when I have my doubts and my weaknesses like anybody else. I want to go back and backtrack just a little bit because there's one thing, and again, it's about your shop. When somebody walks into your shop, it does not look or resemble what people would think a vapor store should look like. No, or, no or, I've got house plants in here that are real. I have to water those damn things twice a week. It's almost uh, like you walked into a day spa. Well, I don't know about day door. spa. I, I like to think uh, low end jewelry shop. There you go. <laughs> it's true because you have display counters that would remind you of being in a jewelry store. You have yeah. lighting that is very similar to that kind of environment. I, I mean, you walk in and it's not, you don't have stuff plastered all over the place. It's very neat, it's very organized. You have actual seating in the middle of your store. By the door. Mm -hmm. Uh, We we pulled out a lot of the interior seating because I didn't want it to become a hangout. Right. Uh, So we have seating by the door. Largely that's there so that if mom shows up and she's got her four-year-old in tow, because moms can't always ditch their kids, there's a place where the kid can sit that's not on the sales floor, right? So the kid's not exposed to the e-liquids or anything. But everybody in the shop can keep an eye on the kid and make sure that they're not at risk either. Uh, it doesn't get used very often, but that's what that seating is for. Uh, other than that, I got seating back behind the counter, but that's for me when I want to take a nap. <laughs> now, you run your store where you are. You're a one-man band. That's right. From about uh, 8 o'clock in the morning until 9 nine thirty at night depending uh i come in early i've got meetings with the uh with the the advocacy group i'm with or sorry the trade association i'm with so i like to come in a few hours early work on that get my emails out of the way if i gotta look anything up then i can do that then we have our dial-in meetings for the for the trade association and then at 10 o'clock shops open Wow. Uh, shop stays open till nine o'clock at night, shut her down. And if it's a good night, I'm out of here by nine Oh two, go home, go to bed, get up, do it again. Have you ever found that at that point to be discouraging just by yourself? Or have you found now that you've retired from a career that you actually enjoy being able just to be in there by yourself? I would love to have a day off. <laughs> However, four kids at home got to eat. They got to be educated. The lights got to stay on. So like every other dad on the face of the planet, you do what you got to do. Yeah. My wife runs very similar hours in Morinville. Her only saving grace is that shop shuts down earlier day to day. And it's closer to home. But the reality is, is... We had a part-timer this summer. He got a house somewhere else, so he left. And then September happened. And everything started We're just coming back from September. I've got an issue with a 16-year-old causing me some grief. I have to go get a ID scanner. That's my part-time employee, so now that's on hold for another couple of months. But as soon as the money is there, yeah, there's a part-time employee coming, and my wife's going to get some days off first, because if she has days off, my life is so much better. It is the truth. Anybody that is married will agree. If Mama Bear is happy, everybody's happy. If Mama Bear ain't happy, I don't care. Ain't nobody going to be yeah. happy. As far as the days and hours personally go, I was always the type of guy, it doesn't matter. I'm awake. I got to do something. This is it. This is what I do right now. 
So this is what I do. See, but you're also tagging in on top of that, working with your your group to make sure yeah, that the, you... The, I, I work with the National uh, Trade Association in Canada. And where do you find time to fit that in? That's that period of time between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. every day. Wow. Wow. Uh, or there's sometimes I'll have a meeting while the shop's open and, and then they, they're waiting on me, right? It's like, I'm sorry, if I got a customer, you're on hold, I feed the kids, mm-hmm. but I, you, you figure out ways to make it work. The reality is you start your day with a list. And if you go to bed and that list is a little bit smaller then you've made headway. And that's the way I go. It's, it's, I used to work with a guy called it the 1% principle. I'm going to come in today. I'm going to make things 1% better. Just 1%. That's all I got to do. Just 1% better. And if you do that, that's continuous improvement. Every day is just a little bit better. Just a little bit better. And that keeps it manageable. Because some days if I walked in and looked at the list of things that I had to do, well, I'd lose my mind. See, this is part of what intrigued me about watching you in different aspects and and reading some of your your chats and your posts because it's the small things that you do that end up having some very massive impact. You're not running around with your hair on fire. You're you're not running around with your the sky is falling attitude. You're like... Sometimes. Oh, sometimes we all do. But predominantly, you're you're going at it one step at a time. Keep your cool. Get something done. A lot of it comes down to to critical thinking. Okay, we used to you used to actually be taught critical thinking. This idea to look at an object, separate your emotions from it, and just look at it logically. And that's something. I think it's still out there. I think it gets overridden by popular media and hype. And and sometimes it'll set me at odds with other people because I'll look at something and I'll see something there that I pick up on that. I just don't see other people picking up on. Uh, And and for, for a really contentious one, this is going to anger lots of people. Jewel is not the source of all our problems. You want to know how I know that? How you don't get 70% of the C store market unless you're reasonably effective at reaching smokers because it's not 70 70% of the C store market is not going to miners. If you look at the news clips that come out where they're yelling at Jewel and they show you the box of all the stuff that's been confiscated, pause the screen, count the number of jewels in the box, then go back and count the number of smock Nords. <laughs> and as a shop owner, I can tell you because I had these eight last year. I had it seemed like every time I turned around, I was looking, oh, it's a birthday two days ago, birthday last week, birthday last month. But the young fella or lady walking in already has a mod in their hand. Mm-hmm. So I just started asking them, you know, where were you, where, where'd you get that from? And they started telling me, you want to know how many of those young people were carrying a jewel? Zero. Really? Not a single one. I saw one or two with a stealth, which is kind of like the vape version, right? But most of them smoke Nords. Looking for 48 milligram or 50 milligram Nick in a bottle. So when I see the fire up about Juul, both in the press and on our side, when I go out and I actually start looking at things, I don't see it represented in the physical reality. What we have was Matt Meyer, Smoke Free Kids, uh, Heart and Lung. They all went after the 800-pound gorilla of the vape industry. Yeah. Who's the 800-pound gorilla of the vape industry? That's you. Okay. When we talk about flavors attracting kids, how many people out there actually think Jewel Mango tastes any damn good at all? I've never tried them, so I, I honestly don't know. So so that's, you know, sometimes seeing things the way I do, it sets me up. It actually sets some of people I would work with normally against me, right? They're not happy when I say these things. 
No, because you're but not this agreeing is just with them. what I see. You're able to go out and take a look and see what's actually happening, and you're not just following a crowd. Well, I'm not responding to the media hype. The media can scream all day long that it's Joel. That's what they do. They're going to scream all day long that it's flavors. They're going to scream all day long that it's this, that it's that. It's because the sun rises in the east. That's what media does. Hype sells newspapers. Panic sells newspapers. Panic gets advertisers on television. So they push panic. That doesn't mean I have to respond with panic. I don't have to get angry at Jewel because the guy on CNN is screaming that Jewel addicted an entire nation of children. What I do need to do is I need to go out and I need to look at the studies and the data and the information that's available to me and find out why youth are interested in this product. What product are they interested in? How are they getting their mitts on it? Then I can start to see things like, okay, so the majority of youth uptake comes through social sources, which means that ID scanner I put in before Christmas so I could prove to the authorities that I check ID for everybody who comes in the shop has a very low chance of actually impacting the numbers of youth getting their mitts on vapor devices within five square kilometers of where I am because they're not coming into my shop and buying it. They're getting it from the 19 year old, the 18 year old who can come into my shop and buy it legally and then whips back and sells it to them for twice the price. Do you limit quantity sold? I haven't had any big bulk purchases, so we haven't had to. But in Canada, Jewel actually has a bulk purchase limit. I think it's five boxes. That's the most you can pick up. Yeah. But like I said, nobody buys jewel in my shop. I, I get one case of replacement jewel pods about every four months. Wow. And a case consists of eight boxes of jewel pods. It's here because every smoker on the face of North America has heard that word jewel. So if I do get a smoker and the odds are, is they're asking, do you have a jewel? Mm-hmm. And then I, usually wind up selling them something else, but they come in looking for that product. So it has a place. And for some of them, they use it. That's what got them to quit smoking. I don't care. I've always been, I'm not going to say anywhere near an advocate. I have always been a person that believes Juul has its place in converting a smoker and getting them away from combustible tobacco. I I believe that. But Uh, not so much Juul, but that, type of device correct okay dead simple to operate doesn't require any instruction available at a place where a smoker is buying cigarettes that's key because a smoker will go in and buy their pack of well it's an american show so let's say marlboros they're going to go in there every day for 10 years buy their marlboros at the local gas station And every day they look over and here's this little plastic stick that they keep hearing about in the news. And then one day, just on a whim, they pick it up. Now, if that works for them, that's the start of the journey. And within five, six months, you know, they're going to have a beef that I don't like the flavors anymore. My taste buds came back and this thing tastes like junk or the battery doesn't last long enough. Well, then they're going to be curious. Now they will go into a vape shop. But as a smoker, you can't reach somebody who doesn't walk through your door. Uh, So there needs, I I firmly believe that there needs to be some version of vaping technology available wherever the cigarette is sold. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be hugely visible or trumpeted. It's just got to be there. So that when they decide, you know what, I'm ready to try something different, that it's available for them. What are your thoughts along that line, since we're talking about it? What are your thoughts of the IQOS? I I played with one, actually. When they first came out, what was that? That's got to be close to two years ago now. 
up there ordered, it might have been. Down here, they just came out in Atlanta a month or yeah, two ago. Yeah, you guys had to wait until it came through the FDA, but we could order them online like a year, year and a half ago. When they, when they were first out in Japan, it wasn't long after that that I could order one. And I did. And I played with it. And my honest impression, I actually put out a couple of videos about it. When I'm playing with stuff like that, I go into it, and the only question I have is, if I had had this five, six years ago when I quit smoking, would this device have replaced my cigarettes? In regards to the ICOS, the answer I came up with was yes. Would I have stayed with it? Probably not, because at the time, it was a little too complex for the average person. It's not like a jewel. You pick it up, you plug the pot in, and you puff, right? Right. You got to figure, you got to get this thing in. You got to eject the stick. You got to, you know, occasionally the tobacco plug falls out inside. Then you got to clean the device. And it was a bit too fiddly for somebody who's used to pulling the stick out of a box and setting it on fire. But could it replace a cigarette? Absolutely. I firmly believe that it could replace a cigarette. As a vapor, somebody who was used by that time to having my custards and my vanillas and my blue raspberries, it tasted gross. Wow. But if I was a smoker, it wouldn't have been bad at all. Because a smoker, you got to remember, the smoker is not used to grape neutron or, or Earl Grey tea Yep. when they inhale. They're used to, to burning plant matter. So in that aspect, the ICOS will have appeal for a certain segment of smokers, right? Uh, and it'll work for a certain segment of smokers. I have, I have no doubt in my mind. However, would it be a product that I would still be using today? I don't think so. I like my Earl Grey tea too much. That's, and it's the one thing that there are many times I forget that a it's been long enough, you know, the smoker's palates don't have the same capability that a vapors do. You know, you, you vape long yep. enough, you your palate of taste come back, just like you said. And then you go to puff on a vapor that is a tobacco flavor, and you're like, oh, my God. I don't want that. Yep. And that's when they, they finally fall over into, let me try a strawberry this or a custard that or, you know, a melon or whatever. And yep. and that's yep. when with, when everybody, their eyes light up and go, oh, my God. And there's like thousands of flavors. And you're like, yes. Here, you know, let's let's take a look at some of the more popular ones. And IQS. Yep, that's, that's correct. Uh, the further away you get from smoking, the, the less likely you are to go back to enjoying that flavor. But I keep telling my customers that first puff of that cigarette is going to taste horrible. But if you get to the end of it, it's still very much an old friend. <laughs> and for a smoker, that's vastly important. You know, you get out of bed, some people make it to the bathroom before they have a smoke, some don't. Every time you have something to eat, it, it was the common thing, you, you go and have a smoke. It'd be, you know, in the middle of the day, stress smoking, I mean, oh my God. But if they can understand that they get the same satisfaction out of the vapor product at the same points in time now and again this is a whole other conversation but between more of the traditional what we know for e-liquid with nicotine you know base versus a salt nicotine do yeah. you find where you are that you are selling more of one than the other we did notice that salts sell more than than freebase uh but you got to remember that when this industry moved from the Nautilus oh, to wow. the sub tank, yeah, right. All of a sudden, this fifty-fifty e-liquid, zero, three, six, and twelve, for a long time, it disappeared. You're only that's one of the reasons we have a house line in the shop was because there are very few places where I can get a fifty-fifty mix. 0, 3, 6, 12, and if you're looking for 18, that's even tougher. Um, 
so what salts did was they reintroduced the high nicotine. Everybody talks about, you know, we never used to have 48. They're not wrong. In North America, 48 wasn't a big thing. No. But vaping didn't really get big for us until shortly before the sub tank came out. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the zero three, six took off. If you go to the UK where vaping was around in its earlier forms, where we were using like the CE five and your, your vision twist battery, or even like back to the Ruyen and, and, and the Sigalikes, high nicotine wasn't that uncommon. I remember guys talking about 48 milligram in the UK. Mind you, they were using eight watt devices. Right. And then when we come out with the sub ohm and all of a sudden we're pushing 80 watts, 48 in a, in a free base. In, in, in yeah. luck. You'd choke uh, to death and fall over. That's right. So, again, it's that perspective. Everybody tends to, to color their perspective with their own experience. Right. They don't tend to go looking outside of their experience. Well said. So when people start yelling about the high nicotine level, I, I try to remind them that, hey, you know what? This high nicotine existed before, but it was in a different device. And if you go back to what the jewel is, it's an eight watt device. Yep. It's, it's same pushing 3.7 volts or eight watts or however they've got it set up internally to a fairly high resistance coil and it's making just a tiny bit of vapor. And if you go back to the CE5, it wasn't that different because I remember when the Nautilus came out, the big thing was, was we had this bottom vertical coil hmm. and man, did that Nautilus tank make a lot of vapor. Oh man, that was a huge amount of vapor and the flavor and the, the yep. yada, 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 yada. Everything old is new again. Welcome to your pod device. <laughs> so everything is, is coming back around full circle. But the problem is, is we did exactly what we always do. When sub -ohm came out, 80% of the North American market shoved sub -ohm down everybody's throat who came through the door. If you wanted to quit smoking and you walked into most vape shops, they said, you need this Kanger sub tank. And if you're a pack a day smoker, you need six milligram. And if you're a half a pack a day smoker, you need this three. And then you need to take in this big cloud of vapor and exhale. Yep. For some people that worked. For some people it didn't. Why? Because when was the last time you saw a smoker that had a cigarette by going <sighs> aside from Cheech and Chong? <laughs> Never. So it worked for some people. And where, where sub-ohm really did work was the folks who wanted lung density. They wanted to feel that heavy feeling in their chest that 50-50 PGVG didn't give them. So yep. for them, sub-ohm was the way. But when sub-ohm came in, we forgot all about the 50-50. We, we forgot about the mouth-to-lung guys, and we left them in the dust. And then salt nix comes out. And what's the next thing we're hearing? All the sub -ohmers are going, but nobody's making anything for us anymore. Uh huh. Welcome to the vaping industry. You got to make stuff for everybody. There is no one tool. It's a bunch of tools. Uh, true. And you have to have all of them at your disposal to figure out what you're going to do. I remember when, when sub -ohm came back, you know, and I changed to a Kanger tank. I, I was dumbfounded, you know. And like you I said, I love my Kanger tank. Oh, I still got one. I, I I work with a different one now, simply because I I fell in love with this uh, Denard ETA, you know, yep. and I've had it forever. But when it came out, and I was actually able to get a satisfying to me a satisfying cloud. And it wasn't so much about blowing clouds. It's the density, like you said. It, that yeah, the feeling density that, and the flavor. Yeah. And it just, I'm at 45 watts. My wife, she vapes at 90 watts. She's on a, you know, a 30 mil RDA. And, and I see it there's various all over the place. But you get to that point where it has now directly come to, if you don't have the pod because it is quick and easy 
unless somebody's willing to take the time to look at either the mouth to lung or a smaller tank, they might just walk back out the door. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is you got to have that balance. So, like, I've got Inican product for the folks who are a little more at ease with pushing buttons and stuff, mm-hmm. right? I have the stealth device, which is plug and puff. I've got the caliber and for refill and plug and puff. Uh, I've got 200 watt mods. I've got 40 watt mods. It's, it's having that balance in the shop. Like you can't, it's really easy to go with whatever's selling this week. But if you're doing that, you're limiting your reach to your customers. You got to have a little bit of everything. You don't have to have every mod on the place. Otherwise, we'd all be smoke shops by now because that company puts out new shit about every... There it is. Uh, it's, it's, I but you got to have a little bit across the spectrum. It, it's one thing that I noticed in a lot of shops, and everybody's been talking about it. We all know that the new product came out and the shops would push the new, new. And the only people that were really buying it were people that were already converted. And those particular types of shops went in a very different direction and left the smoker standing there going, okay. Some of them. The ones that couldn't quit with whatever was popular at that moment would either become dual users or they would go back to smoking. And and that's the hard part. You got once. If you're lucky, you got twice. Because smokers are so used to everything not working. Tried to patch, didn't work. Tried to gum, didn't work. Tried to pill, didn't work. Tried the lozenge, didn't work. Tried vaping, didn't work. Fuck it, going back to smoking. Yep. You got once. And if you're lucky, twice. If they come in the second time, that's that's your last chance. If you don't get their, their, their poop in a group on that visit, they're going to go back to smoking because that's how they're trained. I try this, it doesn't work. I go back to smoking. And chances are you won't see them the third time. No. Uh, I used to pick up guys who would come from other shops, right? They, they'd they come in and they'd have questions about whatever it was they were working with. And for a long time, I actually gave away a lot of equipment because I'd have a guy would walk in my... The one I remember, a guy walked into my shop and he says, this thing burns my lips. And I said, what is it? And it was that... Kanger mod, the one that had five batteries in it. Oh, good God. Right? Five 18650s in this battery. They give him a rebuildable dripper. And they didn't teach him what to do with it. Because when I looked in, there was no cotton. He'd burned that out ages ago. He was dripping liquid into this dripper onto a bare coil and hitting it at 100 watts. And he says, it burns. Well, yeah, it, it burns. When he walked out, he, he went out with a T18 Endura. So that's how long ago that was, because I was selling the Endura was my primary quit smoking mod. Wow. That right? was a while ago. I, I said, look, you take all of you take all of that. I said, put it back in the box. I said, someday you might use it. But you might not. I said, take this one. We're going to double your nicotine from what they give you. You're going to puff on this. And I showed him how to use it. He walked out, please as punch. Right. But that was his second visit. He bought the device. It wasn't working. He went into the nearest vape shop and he happened to run into me. Now there's a handful of shops around. Actually, there's, there's a decent number of shops around where I am, where he could have been set straight. But if he'd have walked into it to the wrong shop, Oh, well, you just got to put cotton in that thing without explaining why the cotton's not there now. <laughs> You know, he'd have had another bad experience and he'd have gone back to smoking because that's what I would have done. Yep. Here's something to think about. And I'm curious to see what your response is going to be. Just extremely recently, and we don't even know exactly if it's finalized or not. There's a little bit of information in the States right now saying that they're probably going to be taking flavored pod systems out of the open market and leave tank systems, vape shops running yeah, as they that. are. Is that going to impact how things happen in Canada? I mean, are you expecting a something I to th- come I rolling in? I think we were already on our own path. 
uh, because if you look, certain provinces in Canada are are doing the same, if not worse. Like if you look at Nova Scotia, they have a complete flavor ban. Mm-hmm. It's on the books. They're waiting for April first, right? Because it was a legis it was a regulatory change, not a legislative change. So it doesn't require public feedback. Doesn't have a question period. Nothing. They changed the regs, and on April first, flavors are banned in Nova Scotia. Uh, BC's kind of doing something similar there with we're going to pull certain products out of C stores. Uh, flavors in particular are going to be out in C stores. And then when you go into a vape shop, you're going to have to, you can get your flavors there. What I would caution about this is, is over the last couple of days, I've, I've seen people celebratory over the survival of vape shops and they should be. However, I would caution that we don't get too excited for a couple of reasons. Once the flavors aren't in the C stores, do you think those kids are going to stop vaping? Nope. Okay. So who's left to blame when the kids keep vaping after the C stores are gone? Well, not that there only is leaves. Only group left to blame after the C stores are gone because yeah. nobody's blaming social access. Nobody blames uncle Bob. Nobody blames our older brother, Tim. Nobody blames the 19-year-old at high school who's selling the shit out of a bag. They're going to blame the vape shops because that's what they do. It's not about the kid that broke the law or the guy that broke the law. It's about the guy who provides the product legally because he's the easiest one to single out. So once these flavors aren't in C-stores and little Timmy gets caught with unicorn poop, (laughs) we're next. And that's the same for every argument. If we'd have hit high Nick... We're going to pull a high nick out of, out of C stores because 70% of your youth are accessing their stuff through social access. They didn't give a shit about the C stores to begin with. No. So they're still going to be vaping. Only now you don't have C stores. So Matt Myers, who is not going to be happy until prohibition is a thing because prohibitionists do not get relaxed until prohibition is in place is immediately going to turn around just as viciously as he used to smack Jewel about with a two by four. And he's going to start smacking vape shops. So keep that in, in mind. We have a reprieve. Vape shops got saved. And God help you if any of them are selling to kids. Because if that comes to light, the government is going to come in and beat you until you're purple. Well, it brings, this is your one chance. You can't screw it up. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And, and shops need to to pay attention to what's going on. And hopefully most of them have been able to see the light and say, we've got age verification, we've got this, we've got that. But it brings right up to that wonderful wall that is going to happen in the United States in May called the PMTA date. Yeah, you see, that's be, that's... That's one thing I don't have a lot of in-depth research into because it's not something that impacts us here. Dimitri is your guy for the PMTA. I, 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 know, I know Jack. Well, it's, it's my question that I wanted to ask is if that stays where it's at and all e-liquid and hardware come off the market until they pass the pre-market tobacco, is that going to affect, is is the legislative bodies up in Canada going to look at this and go, hey, look what they just did. Should we be doing something similar? Is that My knee come- jerk is I hope they do because I'll be the guy there pointing out what cigarette sales were last month compared to what they are the month after they do that. That's the, it's like Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia is horrible. The vape shops are going to have a very tough time surviving if they survive at all because of the way they did it in the timelines, I'd really love to tell people that we could stop it, but I don't think we can. And I've already started collecting data. How many cigarettes were on, were sold in that province a year ago, a month ago, how many cigarettes get sold in May? And then after April 1st, when vaping, products are essentially choked into non-existence how many cigarettes get sold because sometimes no matter how hard you fight the only thing you're left with is the example of why we never should have done it 
Mm-hmm. And, and it's important that that data is collected. It's wholeheartedly true. You know, but here again, it, and I've seen information go floating around on Facebook and everywhere. They're saying the top 10 states that take in the most master settlement agreement money down here are also the top 10 states that are trying to do flavor bans and everything because they're losing millions, multi-million dollars that go into their state coffers from the MSA yep. money and taxation. And so they're, they're right on the side with the Kentucky Fried Chicken group that they want the flavor ban enacted to preserve their income. And I don't know yeah. if that is similar, that you see the same thing similarly up north or not. I don't. It would be tough to tell. When, when you get into who benefits like that, who financially benefits, that list is very long. And it's incredibly convoluted. Uh, I think we would be more likely to see a problem up here to save the children than we would to save the taxes. Uh, see but they're using the kids and they push the kids out front and we don't want our kids and and somebody said it exactly just the other night and I keep thinking it for months when was the last time that you saw a commercial, a print ad any advertisement saying we want our kids don't smoke oh you haven't seen that in years yeah ever since vaping really became a very popular thing for people to That's stop. Right. Nobody smoking. cares about the kids smoking. Nobody cares about the 40% that drink and the 10% of those who exceed the low what is it? The low risk dependency guidelines is what we use in Canada. These are the kids that are either drinking often enough or binge drinking enough that they run the very real risk of develop becoming alcoholics. Nobody kids cares about the kids doing cannabis right now. No, it's about the vaping. That's what the hype is, right? Yep. The politicians, I don't think that they're nefarious. I, I don't. And I know that that's not necessarily popular in certain circles. I think they are no different than 80% or 90 plus percent of my customers. They watch the news. And they see this hype and this fear and this drive Regardless of where it came from, whether it was tobacco free kids started this crap five years ago, whether it was a valley last summer, the fact remains is that they are subject to the same media message that everybody else in the country is. Your politician is not special. He goes to work every day, he comes home, he turns on the news. And if what he sees on the news is a 12 year old chucking clouds in front of an elementary school, and then he goes back to work the next day and he's got 15 phone calls from angry mothers. He is going to go out to save the children. And if that means every smoker within a hundred miles gets emphysema and dies, <laughs> he's not even going to be aware of that fact because the news isn't showing him that the news is showing him children becoming addicted to nicotine. So he responds just like everybody else in the news. And nicotine right? is no different chemically than caffeine. That's what studies say. Yes, nicotine is no different. However, you need to, in order to get into that, you got to get into the whole anti-smoking thing, right? In a lot of ways, it was easier before vaping existed. Quit or die is an incredibly simple message. It's really easy to monetize. It's easy to get out in the market. It's easy to, to build your processes around. And then along, we came along. And we took that whole model and we kind of just threw it right in the toilet because now you don't have to quit or die. It's no longer simple. Now we've got a complex thing because we've got to tell smokers that they have a better option. They have harm reduction. They don't have to quit or die because the reality is most of them chose the latter. But at the same time, we don't want, I don't want my kids vaping. No. I don't want them dependent on nicotine. So that message has to go to them. But the problem is, is if your whole system is geared around quit or die, it's very hard to pack up that whole multi-billion dollar anti-smoking industry 
and get them to turn ship, right? To change course, to go on to something new. Because they've been doing what they've been doing for 50 years. And for them, they see it as being effective. This whole, we went from 50% of the Canadian population smoked to 15 in 50 years. That's a good thing for them. I look at it and go, well, 50 years and, and you got from 50 to 15. But for them, that was good. Then we came and screwed it all up. <laughs> right? I like your choice of words, honest to God. Well, that's how they feel. We screwed well, it up. If you listen to them talk on the news, we're worried about backslipping on our anti-smoking measures because, you know, we were doing really good and now kids are using nicotine. Yeah, well, 20 years ago, kids were using tobacco. Yep. Most kids are getting lung cancer now. But you said that they are dependent. You did not say addicted. Which is the There's truth. There's a difference between dependency and addiction. I've never seen somebody give a blowjob for a jewel. <laughs> there, oh, is, there is actually oh, a definitive oh, difference shit. between dependency and addiction. <laughs> dependency is this product I use every day. And if I don't use it, I notice. Addiction is, is if I don't have it, I will commit a crime to get it or I will do something that is morally reprehensible. And again, I have never seen somebody get a blowjob for a jewel. That's just hilarious. I have never heard anybody put it in that kind of a way, but it's so true. And, and it's the one thing you said, it's dependency, you know? Yeah. Oh, Lord. Well, I'm going to tell you something. We, we've we actually gone over our hour, and I know that I'm, I want to be able to get you out of your store and on your way home, because yeah, today's one I'm of your awake. early days. If you had one or two things that you would want to tell people wrapping all of this up, what would you tell them? Hang in there. Uh, it's My gut feel is it's going to get worse before it gets better. The honesty in me says not everybody's going to come through this on the other end. And that includes me. There's no guarantee that I've got the magic solution. Cause I'll tell you, there's people in this industry make way more money than I do, but we're not all going to make it through those that do. God bless you. Keep moving forward. Uh, if you are, if you're the type of person that tells your mother that she shouldn't believe everything she hears out of the news. Then apply that same thought process to you when you're looking at the news, right? This is why I tend to have different opinions in the vaping industry than lots of folks. Cause I don't believe it when CBC tells me vaping is killing kids in the U S I also don't necessarily believe CBC when they say jewel is the source of all our evils. Because once Jewel is gone, there's going to be a brand new source for all our evils. There will always be a source of all our evils. And if you jump on board and you lose your minds and you help get rid of that, just remember, sooner or later, there's only one guy left standing in the room. And the guy that drove the bus over Jewel, he's looking for you next. So use that critical thinking with everything that you see in the industry on both sides. We have the guys selling the, the, I've got the PMTA solution, you know, and then we've got the guy who's, you know, uh, telling you it's all Jules fault. Use that critical thinking. Don't, it's really tough sometimes to put your emotions aside. There's days I turn off the microphone. I turn off the camera. I go into the back of the shop and I yell and scream for a good five minutes and I get it all out. <laughs> and then I go back and I pull out whatever the hell it was I was reading and I read it again. There is no single savior. There's no silver bullet. It's going to be a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of different things is going to be what keeps this industry moving. Because uh, if there was a silver bullet, we'd have used it already. Yeah, we would have used it already by now. There's no doubt about that. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to Thomas Kursop. He is the owner of Alternatives and Options in what what city and location are you at in Canada? St. Albert and Morinville in Alberta. It has been an absolute pleasure being able to it's sit and talk with you finally. I've wanted to do it for a while, but our schedule's never married up until today. And I'm like, I don't care what's going on. This is what we're doing. And it's a good way to start the new year. Get get people thinking about what's happening. Yep. yep. Fantastic. Uh, it's think, thinking is better than panicking, right? Because the first thing that happens when you panic is you stop thinking. <laughs> and if you're not thinking, it's tough to make a decision. Wholeheartedly so. true. Very, very true. We're going to have to do this again before too long. Because there's a lot of things that I really want to get into. Just time, time is not on our side at this point. But... I'm I'm around. Uh, we'll we'll pop over to shop talk there someday where we can swear more. <laughs> Everybody comments. I have just as much of a foul mouth as anybody else, and I my children are not immune to all of the <laughs> English language. You know, they know it. I know it. It just, for some reason, it, 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 in my mind, got curbed when I first started. I don't know why. Every now and again, it comes out. You're just such a smooth operator. Nobody pictures it coming out of you. <laughs> well, that, I, there were a couple shows that it came out, and I'm like, oh, Lord, you know? And, <laughs> and it, it was crazy. I get off of the microphone, I go talking to my wife, and the F word comes out all the time, all the time. If I'm talking to other people, it's it's in my vocabulary. It's one of my favorite words. When I get on here, it's like just tame it back, leave it alone. It doesn't belong there just yet. Sometimes, it just makes me laugh. Yeah. But at anyhow, at any rate, we we definitely need to do this again because there are some other aspects that I definitely want to talk about. But I wanted people to hear your viewpoint on things, which is dramatically different than what a lot of people down this way think of. It well, really hopefully is. I didn't offend too many of your viewers. No, I, I think that you are that inspirational side that helps them think about what they're doing or where they're going or why. And that's the important part. All right, folks, you've been listening again to Thomas Kursop, who is up in Canada. I appreciate you being here this evening. I very Thank you very you. much for having me. And we'll catch up again here before too long. Uh, coming Absolutely. up next week, believe it or not, and we spoke with her. Oh, this is horrible. See, and just that quick. She is with the TSFA in Tennessee. Nicole Crumley is going to be on next week. And then we'll be back to our normal Thursday nights at 9 o'clock next week. This evening was a Wednesday night because that's what Thomas had open. And I said, nail it down. Let's do this. But we'll see everybody again next week, 9 o'clock Thursday night. Until then, I hope everybody has a great week and a great weekend. Take care, folks.